After more than 30 years, the mystery was finally solved. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're looking at 20 cold cases that were finally solved. And I look and I say, well, what's up? And she's like, I've been trapped in here, and he won't let me out, it's me and my baby. For this list, we're looking at the most infamous crime cases that went unsolved for many years before they were finally cracked. What cold case are you hoping investigators get a break in? Let us know in the comments. The death of Nova Welsh. In 1981, 24-year-old mother of two Nova Welsh had just split from her partner Osmond Bell and was starting to date again. Welsh had reportedly left Bell because he was violent towards her. On August 18th that year, her body was found in a cupboard at her home. A piece of chewing gum had been used to keep the cupboard closed. Welsh's friend received an anonymous handwritten letter purporting to be from a woman who saw Welsh being attacked by the man she was dating. In 2017, over 35 years later, Bell was charged with Welsh's murder after his DNA was found on the chewing gum and the envelope of the letter. He was found guilty of manslaughter and received a 12-year sentence. The Abduction of Jacob Wetterling For nearly three decades, the disappearance of young Jacob Wetterling remained unsolved. On October 22, 1989, Wetterling was biking home when he was abducted by a man wearing a stocking cap mask. He was never seen again. It's something that really changed the lives of both children and parents here in the state. Multiple people were questioned about the incident, but no one was ever officially charged. It wasn't until 2014, when investigators revisited the case, that the name Danny Heinrich rose to the surface. After police found illicit materials in his house, Heinrich decided to come clean and took responsibility for Wetterling's death. He struck a plea deal with the authorities, which prevented him from being charged with the murder. Heinrich later told police where he buried Jacob's body in exchange for prosecutors dropping potential kidnapping and murder charges. Instead, he was handed a 20-year jail term for possession of the illicit materials. The murder of Anna Palmer. It took over a decade, but groundbreaking DNA techniques finally brought closure to this case. In September 1998, young Anna Palmer was coming back from seeing a friend when she was attacked on the front porch of her family home in Salt Lake City, Utah. Palmer's mother returned home to find her daughter pale and cold, with several stab wounds. She was pronounced dead at the hospital. In 2010, DNA evidence from Palmer's fingernails was examined and linked to a man named Matthew Breck. And 13 years after her murder, Anna Palmer's family found closure when forensic experts found DNA under her fingernails that led them to her killer, a man already serving a 10-year sentence in Idaho. Breck, who lived close to the Palmers at the time, was sentenced to life in prison. The murder of Joyce McLean. August 8, 1980 was the last night high school student Joyce McLean was seen by her family. That evening, McLean had gone out jogging and never returned home. That night was one of the first times I didn't worry because she was on foot. What was the last thing she said? See you later, Ma. Her body was found two days later, right behind her school. A few hours after McLean disappeared, a young man named Philip Fournier got into a serious accident after stealing a truck. The crash left him with serious head injuries. However, he eventually confessed to his priest and his mother that he had killed McLean. These confessions remained secret until 2016, when he was arrested and charged with McLean's murder. Police say Fournier was a person of interest from the start, but it is only now that they felt they had the evidence they needed. Fournier's defense claimed his head trauma distorted his memory, leading to the hasty confessions. Regardless, he was found guilty. The murder of Irene Garza. It took 56 years for Irene Garza's killer to be charged. Today, we can say that after a long wait of approximately 56 years is the beginning of bringing justice to the community. Garza was a school teacher and beauty queen in McAllen, Texas, who went to church for confession in April 1960 and was never seen alive again. Her body was discovered days later in a canal. The first and pretty much only suspect in the case was Father John Fight, the priest who'd heard Garza's confession. Fight was the prime suspect almost from day one. His slide projector had been found in the canal near Irene's body, and he had scratches on his hands. Yet somehow the case grew cold. Fight confessed to church officials, who kept his secret for decades. He pled no contest in a separate sexual assault case, but remained in the priesthood. 
It wasn't until a new DA took office that Fite was tried and convicted of Garza's murder, dying in prison in 2020. The murder of Sherry Rasmussen. Sherry Rasmussen lived a seemingly perfect life. She was married to her loving husband, John Rutten, and at 29, she was already the director of nursing at a medical center. That all came to a gloomy end on February 24, 1986, when Rutten returned home to find Rasmussen dead on the living room floor. Sherry was bludgeoned and then shot, and shot several times at close range in the chest uh, by rounds that almost all of whom, which would have been fatal immediately but not before fighting for her life against her killer. Investigators concluded that it was a burglary gone wrong, but Rasmussen's father was convinced it was LAPD officer Stephanie Lazarus, who had had a relationship with Rutten. Detectives scoffed at the idea, telling him he watched too much TV. It took 23 years for Lazarus to be convicted using DNA evidence. Within a few months, had put together a case implicating one of their own colleagues, one of the most shocking outcomes of a murder investigation in the history of the LAPD. Lazarus is currently serving 27 years to life in prison. The Peterson Schusler murders. Brothers John and Anton Schusler and their friend Robert Peterson left their home in Chicago on October 16, 1955, and never returned. The boys had made the trip downtown to see a screening of the Disney documentary The African Lion and fell prey to an unknown killer. Their bodies were found in a ditch after two days. Over two decades later, while investigating the disappearance of millionaire heiress Helen Voorhees Brock, Police learned that stable hand Kenneth Hansen had allegedly boasted about killing the three boys. Almost another two decades passed before Hansen was arrested and charged with the boys' deaths. He maintained his innocence, but died in prison. The kidnapping of J.C. Dugard. For 18 years, J.C. Lee Dugard seemed to have disappeared from the surface of the earth. In 1991, Dugard was on her way to the bus stop in Myers, California, when convicted sex offender Philip Garrido and his wife Nancy abducted her. She reaches the road, a gray car pulls up, a stranger rolls down the window. And his hand shoots out and I just feel numb. He had shocked her with a stun gun. The incident was witnessed by Dugard's stepfather, who unsuccessfully tried to chase down the car. She remained in captivity, where she gave birth to two daughters until 2009, when Garrido made a trip to a college campus with the two girls. Observing his suspicious behavior, a campus official alerted the parole office. This is the place where JC was held prisoner for 18 years, and where police say she was forced to raise the two children she had with the kidnapper. Garrido was brought in for questioning, accompanied by Nancy, Dugard, and her daughters. During interrogation, Garrido cracked and confessed. Dugard and her daughters were finally free. The murder of Jessica Lynn Keene. Jessica Lynn Keene was a bright student and cheerleader whose promising life came to a brutal end on March 16, 1991. Jessica was a popular cheerleader, an honor student and a talented performer. Who could possibly want this young, talented girl dead? After disappearing for two days, Keene's badly beaten body was found at a cemetery in West Jefferson, Ohio. Police first suspected her boyfriend, but this was ruled out by the DNA evidence. The actual killer was caught 17 years later, when DNA from the crime scene matched that of Marvin Lee Smith. Smith had been out on bond and was living in Columbus, Ohio when the incident occurred. 17 years to the day after Jessica Keene was murdered, detectives on the case learned that a DNA match had been found. The suspect was an ex-con named Marvin Lee Smith, Jr. In exchange for avoiding the death penalty, Smith pleaded guilty to the crime and was sentenced to 30 years to life. The murders of Minnie and Ed Morin. On Christmas Eve 1985, the bodies of Minnie and Ed Morin were found in a secluded wooded area in Washington state. The elderly couple had been shot in the backs and dumped in the woods. I was out scouring the different county roads when I got the call over the radio said they had uh, found their bodies. A friend of mine was the one that found them. The eyes of suspicion were cast onto two brothers, local drug dealers John and Rick Reif. But police lacked enough evidence to bring the men to trial. Reportedly, witnesses were too afraid to speak out. 
in 2012, nearly three decades after the initial crime, police had enough incriminating statements to travel to Alaska to arrest the brothers. Unfortunately, justice could only be served to one half of the murderous duo, as John Reif died one week prior to the arrest. You know, we spent all these years working up to this, and the day we get the warrant, he's dead. But I knew that Rick Reif was still alive, so we knew we had to get on this now. Rick was found guilty and sentenced to 103 years in prison. The murder of Diane Maxwell. 25-year-old Diane Maxwell worked as a phone operator for the telecommunications company Southwestern Bell. On December 14, 1969, she was on her way back to work when she was taken to a nearby shack, assaulted and slain. Diane was just 25 years old, a single mother of a four-year-old son. Well, I would tell you that it was the most devastating thing I'd ever experienced. The investigation failed to turn up promising leads, but police preserved a set of fingerprints found on Maxwell's car. The case was reopened in 2003 at the insistence of Maxwell's brother. By this time, the fingerprints were able to be traced to James Ray Davis, a criminal with a long rap sheet. James Ray Davis uh, spent the majority of his adult life incarcerated auto theft, forgery, assaults. Davis confessed to the murder and was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The Double El Segundo Murders. By the time he was arrested in 2003 for killing two El Segundo, California police officers, George Mason was a 69-year-old grandfather living a quiet life in a South Carolina suburb. Back in 1957, Mason assaulted two teenage couples and stole their vehicle. The man, a white male in his early 20s, demanded their money and jewelry. Then he ordered the two couples to get out of the car. He was fleeing the scene when officers Richard Phillips and Milton Curtis pulled him over for a traffic violation. Fearing that he'd be arrested for his earlier crime, Mason discharged his firearm at the officers, fatally wounding them. Mason's fingerprint on the abandoned vehicle and a scar he sustained from a bullet fired by Officer Phillips were instrumental in nailing him. Nearly five decades after the crime, Mason was arrested and charged with murder. The mysterious shooting of Roy McCaleb. When Roy Joe McCaleb was shot and killed in his sleep on September 22, 1985, his wife, Carolyn Crison Wilson, claimed it was the work of an intruder. When she was questioned, Crison Wilson told police that she had been attacked by a man 10 days prior, and the same man had struck again. With no known suspects, the case eventually grew cold, until 23 years later when it was reopened and re-examined. We knew it, and everybody that knew the situation knew it, but some of her friends, oh, she couldn't do that. But she said, I did it now, and that's what we really wanted to hear. Crison Wilson was arrested after investigators uncovered a ploy to cash out two life insurance policies on McCaleb. At the time of her arrest, Crison Wilson was 71 and suffering from lupus and Alzheimer's disease. She pleaded guilty to the murder and was sentenced to just six months in jail. There's not a lot of evidence to go on, and you can find yourself in a situation where you uh, know someone's guilty, but you might not have the kind of proof you need to get it to court. The murder of Susan Schwartz. A deck of cold case playing cards was instrumental in solving the 1979 murder of 22-year-old Susan Schwartz. Investigators handed out 52 unsolved cold case playing cards, including Susan's in state prisons three years ago, hoping to solve over 60 homicides and missing persons cases. Schwartz met her end at the hands of her friend's husband, Gregory Johnson. Johnson was reportedly violent towards his wife, and Schwartz helped her move out of his house and out of state with their child. This act of friendship didn't go down well with Johnson, who detested Schwartz for meddling in his marriage. Johnson drove to her house, dragged her out of the shower, and shot her dead. Police say the 57-year-old suspect shot and killed Susan Schwartz in 1979 inside her Linwood home. He remained free until 2010, when a prison inmate saw Schwartz's face on a cold case card and recalled Johnson confessing to the murder. Johnson was arrested and dealt a 24-year prison sentence the familial crimes of John List. On November 9, 1971, John List wiped out his entire family in their Westfield, New Jersey home and basically disappeared. When police arrived, they entered the house through an unlocked window. The house was cold and there were no signs of activity, but they heard music. The brutal massacre wasn't discovered until almost a full month later, and by that time, List was already hundreds of miles away from home. Over the next 18 years, List settled in Denver, Colorado, where he took up a new name, 
became an accountant, and even got remarried. By 1989, the case was nearly ice cold when it was featured on America's Most Wanted. A neighbor of List watched the segment and quickly called the police on him. And it just all started adding up gradually that he was an accountant and a Lutheran and that he had a, a scar behind his ear and that he was well put together and, and a classy dresser. He was arrested at his workplace and extradited back to New Jersey, where he stood trial for his crimes. He died in prison in 2008. The Accidental Drowning of Dalbert Apogian. The oldest case on our list, the apparent murder of Dalbert Apogian took over 70 years to be solved. In July 1933, young Apogian was declared missing by his family, and six days later, his body was found floating in the San Diego Bay. Apogian's body was mutilated, sparking fears in the city of a degenerate killer. While investigating the case, police spoke with Jack Confer, a friend of Apogian, who claimed to have been fishing with the boy when he accidentally fell into the bay. However, this possibility was ruled out by the coroner. It was decades later in 2005 when detectives officially ruled it an accident, chalking up the boy's wounds to crustaceans and fish. The Disappearance of Aton Pates Aton Pates left home for his school bus stop on the morning of May 25, 1979, and was never seen by his loved ones again. At the end of the school day, when he didn't come home, his mom calls police. By that time, several hours had passed before anyone had any idea that there was something wrong. Those were crucial hours for an investigation. The young boy's disappearance gained nationwide attention and helped establish several movements that were instrumental in curbing child abductions. With no promising leads, Pates was declared legally dead in 2001. The case, however, was officially reopened in 2010. Two years later, police received a tip from the brother-in-law of Pedro Hernandez, who had worked at a nearby bodega at the time of Pates' disappearance. The Pates family has waited a long time, but we finally have found some measure of justice for our wonderful little boy, Eitan. Hernandez had allegedly confessed to his prayer group in the 80s. He admitted to police that he had attacked Pates and is currently serving a life sentence. The BTK Killer The BTK killings began in 1974, when the Otero family of Wichita, Kansas lost four of its members on January 15th. From that time till 1991, the killer claimed six more lives and sent mysterious letters to police in which he bragged of his crimes. His spree lasted from 1974 to 1991, during which time he claimed 10 lives. After 1991, the deaths ceased, and so did the letters. The case gradually became cold and would probably have stayed that way had the killer not rekindled his written correspondence to authorities. Police later discovered that the BTK killer was a church official named Dennis Rader. A local Boy Scout leader, churchgoer, Air Force veteran, husband and father admitted to being BTK. Rader had sent his writings on a floppy disk, and the metadata on it was traced back to him. He was handed 10 consecutive life sentences for his crimes. The Ariel Castro Kidnappings Starting in 2002, Ariel Castro kidnapped three young women and held them prisoner in his home for more than a decade. All three women, Michelle Knight, Amanda Berry, and Georgina De Jesus, were assaulted by Castro throughout their time in captivity. This nondescript house played a huge role in the fact that it could help Ariel Castro in keeping a human prison going. On May 6, 2013, a full 10 years after she was abducted, Barry managed to escape from Castro's house with her six-year-old daughter. A neighbor helped her call the police, leading to the rescue of the other women and the arrest of Castro. Our first glimpse at those tense moments when Cleveland police pried open the front door of Ariel Castro's home, freeing Gina de Jesus and Michelle Knight. He was indicted on nearly a thousand criminal counts, including kidnapping, assault, child endangerment, and aggravated murder. He was sentenced to life imprisonment, but hanged himself in his cell about a month later. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. The Golden State Killer It's one of the most notorious cold cases in crime history. Between 1974 and 1986, 
a series of crimes prevailed across the state of California that were thought to have been committed by three different people. The Golden State Killer vanished in the 80s, gone for decades until investigators say a key piece of DNA evidence connected the dots just days ago. As DNA technology advanced over the years, samples from the different crimes showed that they were all orchestrated by one person. Crime writer Michelle McNamara named him the Golden State Killer. In April 2018, former police officer Joseph James D'Angelo was arrested after investigators matched crime scene DNA with that of one of his relatives. Law enforcement sources telling ABC News they used a genealogy website to help connect Joseph D'Angelo's DNA to past crime scenes, taking that evidence and then comparing it with family members within the online database until they found their suspect. D'Angelo was 74 years old before he was sent to prison for life without the possibility of parole.